Good evening and welcome to the uh, very first of 2018 League of Women Voters Presents, the monthly series about uh, public affairs issues that are important to mid-Missouri and beyond. My name's Randy Picht. I'm the executive director of the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. And I'll be your host tonight. I'm filling in for your regular host, uh, Jim Robertson, who's uh, a little under the weather today. And um, tonight, we, you know, let me start by saying, um, whether you like Donald Trump or whether you don't, you certainly, I think we can all agree on one thing, and that is we are learning an awful lot about our government and our Constitution, whether it be the 25th Amendment that nobody used to talk about, and the Amalians Clause, or uh, what the powers of a special prosecutor uh, are, or could be, or should be. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of knowledge. Uh, and uh, tonight, we're going to continue that trend. And we're going to talk about an issue that's in the news uh, it seems like every other day it was in the news today, um, and that is the First Amendment. And we are very lucky to have an expert with us tonight who is from the University of Missouri Law School, and this is Professor Chris Wells, so welcome very much. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. So um, we have a lot to unpack, and uh, this, we can say, is a short course in all things First Amendment. Um, I think we have um, a movie out that's coming out soon in Columbia. It's out elsewhere called The Post, which is about freedom of the press, part of the First Amendment. We have, um, we have the protests that people are, are uh, getting kicked out of uh, places, and, and, and the First Amendment seems to be being trampled. Um, we have today... Donald Trump saying our libel laws are a sham. So there's plenty to talk about, and I thought maybe what we could do is take each one of those and talk a little bit and maybe explain some of the, the, the high points and the things that it would help people to understand as they hear the, 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 the various uh, developments. So how about we start with um, freedom of the press? Okay. So... So how, how, how does that work? Uh, well, um, right. that's kind of a broad question. <laughs> you want me to talk about it in the context of the Post, which involved a really famous case called the Pentagon Papers case and what was going on there and how it's relevant to... Yeah, I think that's a good example to say how, how it does work because okay. it, it is probably the best known example. Right. Um, so what was happening in what the Post involved... Uh, was an attempt by the government to get an injunction or a court order barring the Washington Post and the New York Times from printing um, stories based on confidential information that had been leaked by uh, an insider, a Washington insider, to the papers. Um, called And the, it was a historic study of um, what had happened in Vietnam, some of the assessments of how the United States had gotten into the Vietnam War. Um, and it was pretty powerful information. So um, the Washington Post and the New York Times published some of this information, and as the Nixon administration saw what had been published, they were uh, somewhat concerned, although not entirely concerned, that there might have been some classified information that was being published. But more importantly, I think they didn't want the American public to see um, that they'd been lied to and that there had been some um, issues that had arisen during the course of the Vietnam War that might have turned the American public against the war much earlier than it did. So they tried to get a court to uh, issue an order preventing further publication of the papers because they were being published as a serial in, in bits and pieces um, under the rationale that um, national secur security would be undermined. And it, this is a pretty common premise for the government to use when they want to regulate speech, and it's probably the most powerful one that the government has in its toolbox. Um, there has to be some reason for the government to try to suppress speech, whether it's um, through criminal punishment or through an injunction. Um, and the strongest reason that they have is that the security of the nation is at stake. So that will come up again and Over, again. again and, and again. It has before it, and yes. probably will yes. again. Yes, I mean, uh, in fact, all of uh, the... Um, 
Supreme Court's modern free speech jurisprudence it really starts with national security issues back in World War One, and so it came up a lot in World War One. It came up during the Red Scare and the communist era, sort of it, com domestic communist issues um, in the 1950s and the McCarthy era, and it came up again in the Nixon administration. Um, so what the Post is dealing with is um, uh, the Washington Post's decision to go ahead and publish that information because it believed that in a court order, um, barring it from doing that, it would be something called a prior restraint. And in First Amendment um, sort of legal terms, a prior restraint, which is an, uh, an order or a, a licensing scheme or some sort of administrative uh, legal scheme that prevents you from speaking before you do it, as opposed to punishing you afterwards, is considered to be the worst kind of legal restraint because it keeps the speech from getting out at all. And so they were determined to fight that. Um, and it went up to the Supreme Court, and it was, it, it is a very interesting, it was an important decision. The court, in a, in a, in a unanimous decision, but it was unsigned, which is unusual in important decisions, um, agreed that it was a prior restraint and said that the Washington Post and New York Times could go ahead and publish. Um, but in a series of very fractured opinions, every judge wrote their own, justice wrote their own opinion, um, they couldn't agree on whether or not the Post or Daniel Ellsberg, who was one of who was the Washington Insider, um, whether they could be criminally punished for having gone ahead and published or leaked the information. So there's a lot of really difficult issues that arise out of this uh, uh, decision as to whether or not, even though you can't prevent them from punishing it or publishing it, you can punish them afterwards. Mm. And um, it, so it's kind of a double-edged sword in terms of the victory. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a Pyrrhic victory, but it's, it's a difficult one. And you see how uh, up in the ensuing decades, the Bush admin Clinton administration, but really the Bush and the Obama administrations, um, uh, very um, uh, heavily pursued leakers of confidential information. And actually some of the reporters who published some of their information um, because they said the Pentagon Papers case didn't prevent us from doing that. So there's a lot of really interesting issues that arise out of that decision. And really that's sort of the concern that a lot of people have right now. And we, we can jump right to that comment today about libel laws being a sham. Mm -hmm. um, so th maybe you can talk a little bit about what are some of the things that could happen in the courts or in the executive branch um, to some of these laws maybe, you know, affecting kind of that ruling about being uh, liable even though prior restraint carries the day, or also what could happen with some of these libel laws that will kind of chill some of the reporting. Okay. Sure. Well. That's another really important case. <laughs> um, it happened a little earlier than the Pentagon Cap Papers case, actually during the civil rights movement, that established that um, really public officials had a very difficult time suing other people for libel. All right, so libel is a common law, um, it, we call it a tort in, in the law. So it's a tort is just a legal wrong, basically. Um, it's, um, uh, it allows an individual to sue another individual if they've made a false statement of material fact that causes some sort of damage to their reputation. reputation. All right, so um, it's a very old tort. I mean, it's been around for centuries, and so it's very widely accepted, but it's usually enforced through the states. It's not enforced at the national level. There's no statute at the federal level that allows you to do that. So every state has their own version of libel law, but they're pretty similar in the states because it's such an old law, um, an old tort. But what happened in the 1960s during the Civil Rights era um, was that um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was um, thrown into jail for, um, uh, I think it was tax evasion, um, and it was in uh, um, uh, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And there was a an advertisement, it was a political advertisement, put into the New York Times in his favor that um, sort of uh, criticized the Birmingham police and some of the um, things that had been done to students who were protesting in his favor. They were having sit-ins. And there were some misstatements there. there were, they were um, uh, not quite right. They were a little bit off. Um, but one of the um, uh, Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, who was one of the city commissioners of Birmingham, 
sued the New York Times, saying that since he was the city commissioner in charge of the police, the misstatements about the police, um, which were uh, kind of alleged a little bit of police misconduct, um, were misstatements about him, and so that they had defamed him. They were false statements of material fact that had defamed him, so he sued the New York Times for libel. Um, in reality, everyone kind of understood that this was an attempt by the Birmingham city officials um, to shut down criticism of the Birmingham officials and their behavior um, more than it was a, really a libel suit. Um, and so, and in fact, I think that was set out right, that this was a way to shut down northern newspapers who libeled the South every day or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, and so this became a real problem because common law libel claims are important when people are libeled. I mean, when they are really um, lied about by another individual and it damages their business or it get, hurts their ability to go get a job, it can be an important tool, um, a really important remedy for them to, to salvage their reputation. But that's not how it was being used. Here it was really being used to shut down criticism of the government. Um, and they won. All right, so um, libel, uh, Sullivan, um, there was a trial, there was a jury. Um, the, it's a really kind of complicated to explain exactly everything that happened, but um, just um, because of the way the jury instructions worked and, and, um, and it was all above board, um, but they were able to basically take all of the decision making away from the jury except was the statement made. Mm. And so um, the jury was like, yeah, it was made. <laughs> and it was of and concerning this um, person and so um, he won and he won a very large award mm. and so if you look at the history of English um, sort of free speech law and early American free speech law this concern about punishing criticism of the government is a huge concern that underlies all of the history of the modern First Amendment mm. so I think the Supreme Court took the case largely because they were concerned that modern libel common law was being used essentially to enforce um, uh, censorship. Mm -hmm. And so they added on a series of very high standards, basically telling public officials, if you are sued for libel, if, or if you want to sue for libel, excuse me, if you are the plaintiff and you want to sue for libel, you have to show that the person intentionally or recklessly lied about you um, in such a way that um, just negligent misstatements, you know, th things that happen in the course of a political campaign or things that just happen in the course of um, everyday kind of talk, debate, that's not enough. Someone has to intentionally sort of or recklessly set out to harm you. There's that malice. Yeah, right? it's the actual malice standard. Um, and that's there for that reason. So when um, President Trump talks about our libel laws being a sham, he's sort of ignoring this long history of why public officials have had this very high standard attached to their lawsuits when they want to sue. Now, it's not perfect. I mean, there are, it does mean that public officials have to endure a lot of falsehoods, you know, negligent falsehoods, or even maybe intentional ones because it's hard to prove that someone said something intentionally. Um, but it's there for a reason, which is if you're not, there would be these um, we know from historical circumstances um, back in England and even at the beginning of the 20th century, um, government officials will use this as a weapon to try to shut down criticism. Yeah, and I think that's happening today to some extent in some of the cases like the, um, the Gawker case. People right? are certainly concerned about the, that. Cer yes, absolutely. Now, those are not necessarily public of, uh, um Officials, public. they are public figures, and public figures are held to the same standard. Public um, figures, public officials, and that's probably the first thing you have to determine: is this a mm -hmm. public, is this a public person, person right. in the public uh, right. light? Right. So that is the first thing you look at: is a public official is somebody who works for the government. A public figure is somebody who is is essentially famous, either for the purposes of the issue that's being litigated or in all lights, someone like um, LeBron James, right? Or um, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody else famous who isn't an athlete. I can't pull <laughs> someone out of my head right How now. about Beyonce? Yeah, there you go. Oh, or not an entertainer, but you know, um, uh, um, Bill Gates. There okay. we go. Somebody who's just, you know, very well known. Um, uh, so that you determine that status. So people 
more like us, ordinary citizens, we are not held to that standard. If we want to sue for libel as plaintiffs, we are not held to that very high standard. Um, we generally um, can prevail if we show that the statements were negligently made, um, uh, and that's not nearly as hard to show. So um, uh, that is one of the things I think that people don't understand sometimes is that libel law, it matters who you are. The standards are different for plaintiffs in different categories, and most people will never be held to the standard that President Trump is held to. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't there something about the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech that also has to do with uh, public and 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 who who has what right? You know, every it seems like a lot of people like to say, it's my right to say whatever I want to say, but um, aren't there rulings that there are limitations? Oh, sure. There's and there's sort of uh, an aspect to this of, of private public. Well, it sounds to me like what you're asking about is this issue of some speech is um, uh, determined to be low, what's called low value speech or um, uh, uh, sometimes it's called lowish value depending on where it falls. But libel is considered to be a low value speech category. Um, and so that's why it's more easily regulated. Why, why the First Amendment overlay on speech is not as strong. So um, the court has kind of two two or three, I'm going to talk about two of them for the moment, um, really strong pillars of First Amendment law. Um, one is that the government cannot discriminate against speech based on its content, right? So it can't tell you, you can't talk because we don't, we, the government, don't like what you're saying. We, okay. like, so, for example, it can't say anti-abortion protesters, you can talk, but pro-abortion protesters, you cannot talk. So that content discrimination is, is not allowed. That's a pretty, very strong principle of the court's um, uh, jurisprudence. Um, and so that's kind of the first rule. No content, especially viewpoint, right, right. Um, discrimination. And so content neutral regulations are allowed if they um, are reasonable and they still allow speakers to, to get their message out. So, um, for example, uh, requiring people who want to parade to get a permit so that the, um, they know, all right, you're not doing it at rush hour or there's not already another parade. Um, but again, they can't issue those permits based on the content of the speakers. They have to be neutral like you know, we just don't issue permits for parades during um, well, rush Public hour. safety issues. Yeah, exactly. Kind of those types of things. So that's kind of the basic first rule. But there's an exception, which is the second rule, which is low value speech um, can be more easily regulated, even though those low value speech categories are content based. So the low value speech categories that the court has recognized, and it's been pretty clear that it's pretty limited, <laughs> and it's not going to broaden these, um, libel, um, maybe privacy. Privacy is a little bit iffy for them, but it, it's probably privacy. Um, threats, um, incitement to illegal activity, um, child pornography, obscenity. Um, commercial speech is, uh, was low-ish value, but may not be as low value anymore. You can regulate it more readily because of its informational value as opposed to its kind of sort of political value. Um, and I'm trying to think if I've got all of them, but, um, oh, uh, uh, speech that is integral to criminal activity. So for example, um, uh, soliciting a crime or, uh, um, uh, you know, aiding and abetting a crime, mm -hmm. uh, those types of things. So those are, and I may be missing one or mm -hmm. so, but, um, those low value speech categories, all of them are related to the content of the speech. If you sell someone, they can't threaten another person. You're clearly telling them certain content is unacceptable, but it's because that speech, um, the harm associated with that speech so far outweighs any value that that speech can bring, um, uh, that the court has sort of carved out. Oh, fighting words. That's the other, fighting that's words. the other. <laughs> low so value now, speech so how does that work? So that means that if you do something like that, you can be sued, you can, or the, you, mm -hmm. the government can somehow prevent you yes. from doing any more of it? Yeah. Well, so they can e either the government can punish it criminally, as in the okay. case of fighting words, obscenity, child pornography, um, threats. Almost always those will be the subject of criminal sanctions. Um, within threats, the issue of intimidation and harassment are kind of also coupled in there. They're a little bit harder to deal with. Um, and those could be the subject of civil enforcement, as you point out. So someone could sue you for harassment. Um, uh, or intimidation, because those are sometimes um, civil torts that are recognized. 
Um, but libel is the one, and privacy, invasion of privacy and libel are the ones that um, you usually see as the subject of uh, law lawsuits, tort lawsuits, where one individual is suing another individual. Mm -hmm. um, and is that, so in the, the, the First Amendment realm, is that an area that is becoming more, you know, prolific in terms of, uh, of litigation or, you know, where are we in First Amendment sort of cases right now? Um, well, it's interesting. Um, when the court determined, as it stated, really in the mid-90s, there was a, a pretty well-known case uh, um, called R.A.V. versus City of St. Paul, where the court made clear contest discrimination it's off the table, right? You can't, you just cannot do it. There is a presumption against content discrimination by the government. So I think that um, legislators and city and, and state and, and federal officials figured out we really can't enact statutes that regulate speech based on its content. It's going to be, we're, they're just going to keep getting struck down right. because someone's going to challenge them, the ACLU or another advocacy group or an individual is going to challenge that statute. And the first thing they're going to say is, look, it's clear it regulates speech based on its content, and it's going to be subject to this very high standard of scrutiny the court uses, and we're going to have a really hard time justifying it. They've almost never upheld those kinds of statutes, unless they fall into a category of low-value speech. So starting in the mid-'90s, you did see government officials try to justify regulations of speech as low-value speech regulations. And that's why, um, for example... There was a, a case called United States versus Stevens where they were regulating um, animal cruelty. It's a, it's a pretty well-known case um, uh, because of um, what at the time was known as this phenomenon of crush porn videos where, mm. for not to get too graphic, but it was sexual videos where the killing of small animals was involved. And it's really pretty horrifying. Um, and so, I mean... I think because of a desire to really stop the trafficking of those videos, they tried to regulate the, these as animal cruelty, and they said, well, it's like obscenity or child pornography. They're helpless animals. But the court said, yeah, but that they don't, for reasons, and they had very strong reasons for why they said this, they don't fit into those categories, and we're not creating a new category. Mm. We just, we aren't doing that. That happened with that. It happened with violent video games. Hmm. Because video games, um, there were uh, attempts in many states in the late 90s and early 2000s to regulate um, video games based on their violent nature and some of the psychological studies that were coming out saying that they weren't good for kids. Again, based on some of the standards that the court had used to regulate obscenities availability to s children. And the court again said, nope, not going to happen. Hmm. So that is something that the government officials have figured out if they can try to regulate something and make it look like one of the low-value speech categories, they might succeed. But it's really hard to regulate according to these standards. The court standards are really specific and they're really high. Hmm. Um, and it's just hard to draft legislation that fits those standards um, when the issue you're regulating isn't that exact thing that right. the court had already dealt with. Trying to fit it into Yeah, this. it's a little bit like fitting a, you know, a, a, a square peg, peg into, into a, a round, round hole. hole. Um, and they're trying. I mean, I think they're doing it in good faith, but it's it's just hard. I mean, these these issues are, are difficult, difficult issues. Um, you know, the, and now they're coming, they're having to deal now with issues like sexting. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, the, there the issue is much more... Um, that actual sexting between minors might be child pornography. Hmm. So now they're having to think about the fact that maybe they don't want to punish children <laughs> for sexting as, under child pornography laws because then they have to register as sex offenders. Mm -hmm. So they're having to create exceptions to their child pornography laws for minors who are sexting to each other unless there's bullying involved. Hmm. So there, every year there's something different in the evolution of how these things occur. But yeah. Well, and like you said before, this is not the first time in history that we have a fair amount of attention on the First Amendment sure. going back to World War I. Um, but it's a little different because it used to be, like you said, you know, we, national security was always kind of trotted out as mm -hmm. this is why this is important for all these issues, really. Um, but it's a little different right now, right, in terms of why things are in the spotlight. Well, I mean, 
I think there are two things that are occurring right now. Um, I think the issue with, for example, that you can liken to the Post issue, right? The the exec, the um, desire to not have the Washington Post publish the Pentagon Papers. Um, that in that issue, in that um, arena, uh, President Nixon and his administration absolutely trotted out national security. And I mean, there wasn't an illusory national security rationale there. They just, they didn't want to give any evidence to prove it because they basically said, look, I'm the executive. I have inherent executive authority. And that's based on a theory that many, but not most necessarily people believe in called the unitary executive, where mm -hmm. when it comes to national security, the executive is the last say and Congress and the judges shouldn't serve as a check. Um, he didn't win that argument, but he, he relied on it pretty heavily. And that's been pretty common in national security cases. I think the difference now is that it doesn't appear when President Trump talks about you should defer to me because of the unitary executive that he's necessarily using a national security rationale. And that's typically um, when it's been done in free speech cases, that those two have kind of gone hand in hand. So he's basically just saying, I'm the executive. I have, I have the power to do this. Um, I will, you know, um, say that the broadening of the unitary executive rationale has been happening for decades. So he's certainly not the first president to want to broaden it. It's just the first time I've seen it in the First Amendment rationale where national security hasn't been coupled with it, right? Right. Um, which does lead back to these concerns of this sort of seditious libel, um, which was the, in England, the concern of the king to crush all criticism of him kind of rearing its ugly head again. Um, that that does appear to be kind of a problem. Um, the other thing I think, and this is less with the presidential administration, but just in general when, when you see people trying to regulate, I think there's this fear of the internet. Um, and that that is also not new. All new technologies have caused people fear, right? So when you get the internet involved, people don't know what to do about it. Um, and it's so evolving and it's so changing. Um, I saw, um, you know, uh, uh, this. Uh, there was a case decided last year, I think it was North Carolina versus Packingham, um, where they tried to keep a sex offender, basically said you can't access any websites or any social media that um, where a teenager might be allowed on. Um, and I completely understand the rationale there, but the court struck it down unanimously saying, you, you know, basically the, the um, internet is like the public square. It's, you know, it, anymore if you tell someone they can't get on the internet, you might as well just dry up their uh, communication ability. Mm -hmm. You've got to try to draft something more carefully. So we have this sort of fear um, that has, it, it happened with movies, it happened with comic books, it's happening with the internet that we can't quite figure out how to respond to the fact that speech is amplified and bad things happen on the internet. I mean, we get Twitter dunking, we get um, doxing, we get all sorts of trolling and horrible things that happen on the internet, but we don't know how to respond to it with regulation. So I think that's gonna be one of the big things that we're dealing with. And that, again, it's just a different iteration of things that happened before. Right, right. The more things change, the more they stay yeah. the same. So. So this has been terrific, uh, and we're out of time, unbelievably. Oh, okay. wow. Time flies when, <laughs> yes. you're, when you're getting your short course and <laughs> learning a lot. So uh, thanks for joining us, uh, and thanks again, Professor Wells, for joining us, giving us that great information. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it.